talk about affordability and the impact of new taxes and fees. But first, like last week, I want to take a, a, just a minute to remind folks that while the attention at the end of the session gets focused on areas of disagreement, there's still a lot of areas of agreement and, uh, and good work being done both in this building and throughout state government. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of attending the Public Service Recognition Awards, which gave me the chance to recognize and meet many state employees who have gone above and beyond and uh, excelled at their jobs. A few weeks ago, we marked the one-year anniversary of the creation of the Agency of Digital Services. In its first year, uh, this agency now has a handle on all our IT assets and investments, which wasn't the free one throughout state government for embracing this transition. As I also mentioned last week, we had a, we have a very good capital budget uh, that moved forward this week. I believe it's all done and completed at this point. Tomorrow, I'll sign two bills focused on equality for women and the LGBTQ community as well. And I'm pleased to see the bill strengthen our criminal laws, work that was done quickly in response to the Fairhaven case and Jack Sawyer's release. And it appears that has passed as well. And there are many more bipartisan bills that will have a positive impact on the economy and Vermonters moving forward. Now, that brings me to the topic I wanted to focus on today. As too many of uh, our families and businesses are, are well aware, the affordability crisis in Vermont is real. And it's undermining economies in most counties across the state, in particular, the rural areas of on the eastern side who battle each and every day with tax-free New Hampshire. Working to reverse this trend is one of the primary reasons I ran for governor. Since taking office, I've uh, talked a lot about how important it is to moderate costs in state government as we work to grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, and modernize state government. My fiscal and economic priorities could not be more clear. Yet the legislative majority continues to advance legislation and proposes millions of dollars in new or higher taxes and fees, knowing I'm going to veto them. Last year, with the support of the Republican minority and some fiscally demo uh, responsible Democrats and independents, we prevented millions of dollars in proposed tax and fees by insisting on a budget that did not raise a single tax or fee. Currently, the legislative majority has either passed or are poised to pass a total of 83 million in new or higher taxes. That includes 25 million of taxes and policy bills in a $58 million property tax increase. It's important to note the state budget already includes more than $150 million in new money, including the following. As you recall, the budget I proposed in January grew by $82 million due to natural and organic growth and economic activity, spending $82 million more this year than last year. Since January, we've also received unanticipated one-time money through tobacco, the tobacco settlement of $34 million in a one-time revenue surplus, as announced last week and agreed to, of $44 million for a total of $78 million. And yet, the legislative majority is still looking at moving forward with an additional $83 million in new or higher taxes. Again, this approach is not acceptable to me. And honestly, it doesn't make any sense to me either. And based on what I've heard over the last two years, and really for most of my political career, it's unacceptable to most taxpayers. Vermonters understand we can't make our state more affordable by making it more expensive to live in and do business here either. They also understand it's going to take consistent fiscal discipline and much more innovation and modernization in state government to strengthen our economic foundation and help families and employers get ahead after the higher and higher burden placed on them in previous years. I want to take a moment to thank the Republican minority and the fiscally responsible Democrats and independents, those, uh, those that live in and represent communities that can't afford and haven't benefited from the policies of the past in both the House and Senate for sharing in this commitment. We are prepared 
to stand together again this year to make Vermont more affordable and our economy stronger. Frankly, this reality makes any effort, this, uh, this reality uh, makes any effort by legislative leaders to pass bills and a budget they know will not receive my support and that I will veto an unnecessary waste of resources. If the majority leadership will focus on ways we can achieve bipartisan consensus that ensure state government is living within its means, making investments that will help grow our economy, and doing its part to help Vermonters keep more of what they earn, then this session can end on a positive note. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or try to answer them. What if there simply can't be consensus with a no new taxes or fees on one side? Again, it seems unacceptable to me when we've had so much growth, organic growth in, in revenue. Again, we're spending upwards over $80 million as opposed to last year. Uh, and uh, newfound money of $44 million is somewhat dropped from the sky, uh, as well as this tobacco settlement fund. There's plenty of money there. We did it last year. We can do it again this year. Do you think that when local voters approved their school budgets, they did so with the understanding that their property tax rates might go up as a result? I, I, don't, I don't feel that at all. I, I know when I went in to vote, uh, that wasn't on my mind. Uh, this was something that I looked at uh, whether, and I didn't vote uh, in one, one sector, I didn't vote for my, uh, my school budget, but because it raised, uh, it went over my uh, growth rate indicator. But I don't believe uh, voters went into the booth uh, and looked at whether, and considered that their property taxes were going to increase next year and voted uh, for this budget in that manner. I just don't believe that. You don't think that voters, when they went in and they saw that their local school budget was going to go up, one and a half to three percent that when they supported that budget that they didn't realize it there'd be an accompanying tax increase no i don't believe so at all where do you think they think the money comes from i don't believe that they thought they were putting that into their equation i don't think that they were looking at whether they to vote yes or no on their budget that was uh, within maybe their um, they thought it was fiscally responsible. Uh, maybe they thought that it was within one and a half percent, but I don't think they put it in their equation uh, that the, that their property tax were going to increase next year by seven, eight, nine cents. I just don't believe they did. I don't. I don't think most Vermonters know that. Well, maybe not the exact percentage or cents, but you don't think they have basic math skills to understand a higher budget means higher taxes. No, I, I don't, because that's not exactly uh, what happens either. Uh, in, in retrospect, when you look at, at how a budget is derived, that's what is the problem with the education fund in and of, of itself. You have communities, uh, schools, districts, and so forth, uh, sending in their invoices, so to speak, and then they take the, uh, the grand list, uh, they do the, the math, and, and that determines the tax rate. So. Uh, through natural growth, our, our grand list does increase. Um, and in some years, uh, it, maybe it wouldn't go up. I, I just don't think that people do that kind of math. They are thinking that uh, this is uh, an acceptable 1.5%, and, and uh, that's the best they could do. They have faith in their school boards, and, and they either vote yes or no. Well, the plan we put forth, I don't think anything's artificial about it. Uh, I believe that the, the plan that we put forth uh, proposes uh, keeping property tax rates stable for five years, making investments in areas that uh, we think will give us a better return. Uh, it will save, uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, anywhere from one to $300 million. Uh, there's so many benefits to what we're trying to do. We're trying to manage the education fund and let it, instead of letting the education fund manage us. And I think there's a big difference there when you take a look at how we're looking at things in the future. So um, I, you know, regardless of how you look at it, uh, the, pro the proposal we put forth uh, is addressing a many, many concerns. And, and the concerns are, are, are some that we talk about almost weekly here, that we have a decreasing population of students. And we're spending 
maybe even $1.8 billion, the single largest investment and expenditure in state government. And that can't, we can't continue in that regard. It can't continue to go up when you have a student population that's decreasing. And a population, overall population, that's decreasing as well. So we have to do something. I, I just don't think it's responsible to just stand back and let it happen. It's not a, just a self-leveling fund. It has to be managed. Somebody has to manage it. So the Democratic leaders would say, you're encouraging them to come to the table and discuss this and compromise on this issue. And yet, they say that you, you, your position is not compromising at all. Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, what, what I've been saying for the last two years, I don't think it's any surprise to any of you that I'm saying no, no uh, increase in tax and fees. I would, I would challenge anyone here in this room that hasn't heard that I've said that consistently over the last two years. They've heard it too. They read your articles. They understand that. This is no secret. So I'm, you know, I'm a little bit surprised that they take such offense at the end to my saying, we're not going to raise tax and fees. Now, we can, we can talk about how to get there. We can talk about how, where, where we spend the extra money or, or how much money there's going to be. Or, or maybe they want to, maybe they want to stabilize tax rates uh, for six years instead of five. Maybe seven. I don't care. That, you know, if they want to go further, let's stabilize tax rates. Let's give Vermonters something they can count on in businesses and so forth and, and allow the organic growth as we did this year. I mean, look, look what we did this year. We didn't raise tax and fees last year, and, and we were able to bring in more revenue organically, $80 million. That could continue if you make the right, right investments in the right area. You, the whole plan is about stabilizing tax rates, but you can't promise Vermonters that their tax bills won't be going up over the next No, that's true, uh, because of the grand list uh, does increase. The, the cost of houses will probably rise, uh, so, but it's a rate. So why provide a double whammy uh, for them when you want to raise the tax rate and, and uh, they're, they're, uh, the cost of housing increases, so you're going to hit them twice. But I haven't, I haven't heard anyone in your administration make clear to Vermonters that you want to hold their tax rate steady, but you can't promise them. Actually, you can promise them their, rate, their bills will be going up. Why well, not give them the full story? Well, I think we have, but I'll, I'll do it right now. Um, we can't guarantee that their tax bills won't go up. What we're trying to do is keep them from going up much further with this proposal. What they're proposing is uh, to continue to let the education fund manage us and allow the tax rate to, to increase so that they, the taxes will go up even more. So when we have uh, the price of housing goes up and the tax rate goes up, you're going to be paying a substantial amount more. So I, I want to be clear about that. What we're trying to do is stabilize the growth, uh, live within our means, and, and, uh, and work, uh, work through as the uh, cost of living increases the, the, and the rise in wages increases that, uh, that this doesn't get any worse. What, what kind of conversations have you been having with legislative leaders this week and how would you characterize those discussions? Um, well, we haven't, uh, I know a lot of my, uh, my administration has been in conversations with um, legislators uh, in committees and so forth. Uh, the, the meeting that I had scheduled with the speaker, um, she uh, canceled today. She was on the floor. Um, the pro tem had canceled his meeting uh, this week as well, our regularly scheduled meeting. So I haven't spoken to either of them this week. Do you anticipate that those will be rescheduled? Um, as far as I'm concerned, they can be. Has your administration and the Joint Fiscal Office moved any closer to finding consensus on what the actual numbers are? I think they are working uh, along uh, those lines, and I might be able to ask uh, Kai to, to our Commissioner of uh, Taxes to come up and explain further, but uh, they do work, uh, normally work together very well and share data and uh, try to come con to uh, consensus. So I believe that they've been doing that. Yeah. Uh, so I, in fact, uh, two of my key staff are, are over there right now. and. Um, you know, I think we were a little bit blindsided by this um, kind of uh, idea that there that there was a calculation problem or whatever. We've since had time and opportunity to connect with them further and make 
certain adjustments where, where basically the plan is in the same place it was when it was first released as far as growth savings and net savings. So, uh, but they're, they're working there right now and we're just trying to make sure that at least they understand where our numbers come from, how we arrived at them. So is the goal to, much like, you know, Cavett and Carr come up with a consensus, is the goal to find a consensus between the administration and JFO? Uh, I, I think a, a consensus understanding of the of the formula and the methodology, I would say. But uh, you know, there are a lot. Of, this is a forecast. This has never been done before, as far as anyone uh, that I talk to knows. Where there's been a proactive step to say, let's look at what this ed fund, what the destiny of this ed fund is in the next five years, and let's plan accordingly. As the governor says, let's let's start managing this a little more actively. That inherently involves forecasts and assumptions of revenue and of savings. Um, coming to a consensus uh, uh, on a fifth year savings amount for ratio improvements is very difficult, but I think we can make a lot of headway in understanding the formulas behind it and the methodology behind it. And um, again, at the end of the day, with uh, almost $300 million of capacity created at the same tax rate while allowing sustainable per pupil growth. Uh, we believe that if you want to look at that capacity as an opportunity to lower tax rates, back to your prior question, or as a margin of error on what our projected savings are, this is a solid, credible plan. Have you gotten rid of the projected savings on the student-staff ratio or staff-student ratio because the language that was given by the Agency of Education to House Ed for that bill only has a task force and it doesn't say 5.15, it doesn't create any kind of actual ratio. So the task force is going to be left up to the task force to come up with a ratio. So then yeah. you can't really bank savings if there's no ratio. Yeah. Um, we have not, you know, we, uh, as you will recall, we went, uh, we floated the idea of the mandate. Um, the House Education Committee was not particularly impressed. Um, so we thought that a task force would be a good way uh, to go about it, to create guidelines, to try to make it not a one-size-fit-all, but try to make it um, unique to each district to take into account their unique needs. Um, so we do think that uh, that's the better way to go. Uh, we also think that uh, task force or no task force, some of these savings are, are already locked in in terms of the momentum towards governance changes um, and towards district um, consolidation and the like. So it's not like we're waiting around to hit the go button and this is all going to happen. You know, a lot of these changes are already in motion, um, including um, different um, uh, staffing and um, you know, achieving scale. But are you taking the seventy-four million off the off of your book savings now? No, we are not. We because intend that to be. Based on a ratio that doesn't exist yet. But we think we can, through the task force and through guidelines and through working with the agency of education, we think we can get there anyway. If these steps are already being taken, isn't hasn't the legislature already done things? Which does manage the, the education fund instead of having it manage us or whatever the terminology, because as the commissioner says, there are two or three uh, Act 46, they're changing the special ed formula, they're doing several things to hold down future spending yeah, already. Well, already. I think that's part of the point. Um, most of it, you know, the surprise has been that this plan came, came out and, and uh, some were shocked by it, uh, but I would contend that you know, two thirds of it is uh, our areas that we've already spoken about, uh, that they've already agreed to. Uh, but we have to get to the finish line. There's other other things that we need in place. The excess uh, um, spending thresholds, I think, are important as well. Uh, and uh, there's there's some uh, movement, I believe, in the House around the Beck Amendment and and caps and so forth. So. I think uh, that there is still a ways to go to make sure that we adhere to this. Uh, but again, if, um, and I believe that there's, I believe, I still believe, that there's upwards to two to three hundred million uh, dollars worth of savings if we do this right. Um, but even if there's, you know, if, if, if they say there's only a hundred million, isn't that worth it? Isn't a hundred million dollars worth it? And keep uh, property uh, uh, tax rates stable for five years? Uh, I think that there's, there's just so much uh, that we could do 
uh, if we just could, uh, could work together and look at what we've already passed or some, each body has already passed in some respects and put it folded into one, one plan. Your tax if commissioner it, testified that the plan came out so late because the menu was released in January and lawmakers did nothing with it. And now you're saying that lawmakers actually ran with some elements of it. So which is it? Well, again, some did. I, I think the House uh, looked at special ed. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the Senate did uh, uh, move forward with that. Um, but, but we have to bring everybody to the table. And, uh, and, the, and again, uh, with, uh, in the House, uh, they had already passed the Beck Amendment at one point. Uh, maybe they want to resurrect that. Maybe they want to bring that into the fold. Uh, but bringing all these proposals together, different ideas, is what we had hoped they would start doing in January. Uh, trying to co uh, coalesce around something that we could all agree to, but there wasn't enough movement. Uh, so we gave them the leeway and they didn't take it. So uh, at this point in time, the House has done some, the Senate maybe have done a little, little uh, in their area, but nobody has uh, come to the conclusion uh, to coalesce around one single plan. That still sounds like two different messages. I mean, on the one hand, you're saying that the legislature is two thirds of the way there. And on the other hand, you're complying as your political messaging has stated overtly this week, that they have done nothing. Well, no, I, again, two thirds. Gibbs said they have done nothing. Right. But they haven't passed anything. Two, they've come well, two they thirds of the way there. What's that? They, they have worked. They have been working through the session. Well, what have they passed? Well, the session did they pass, over. Did they pass special ed? No, it isn't over. That's the whole point. We're here at the table. We're trying to bring them all together. And uh, with ideas we have, ideas they have, and put it all together in one plan. So, I, you know, I'm sure they've been working on something, but they haven't passed anything. Governor, the 25 million from policy decisions that you say the legislature has added to the tax bill, to the tax load. What, can you itemize? Where we that we have from? actually we have something here. Um, I, I don't know if it's here or not, but we can get that to you. There's a whole list. Is there any respected figures in the education community that you can point to that think what, you're, what you want to do is a, is a great idea and the legislature should comply? Uh, I haven't. Uh, I wouldn't say that we found a whole lot of uh, support uh, within, the, within the legislature, but uh, again, we look at uh, areas that uh, may have been agreed to in the past, uh, just trying to bring it all together. And, and, and again, this isn't... The, the areas that we're talking about, it's not as though these are new issues. Uh, we've been talking about this, every, many have been talking about these issues uh, for a couple of years, but we're just bringing them all to the table and uh, hoping uh, that we can come to some consensus on this so that we can adjourn but, and but save some money. Question, are there any principals, superintendents, teachers, um, leaders in the educational world that are saying, Governor, we're with you? I, I haven't heard of any. Is, uh, it, does that explain why the, there's been a complete absence of the agency of education through this whole debate? I wouldn't say that there's a complete absence of well, the agency never spoken, of education. As far as I know, in a public forum or to any legislative committee about this, this proposal. So the agency of education has been engaged almost from the beginning, um, as has the Department of Taxes, Agency of Human Services, Commissioner of Finance and Management. So we've, this has been a global effort, and the Agency of Education has uh, engaged throughout. They were also at the briefing on the Secretary Fouché was also at the briefing on the um, it, it isn't just uh, Democratic leaders that are averse to this idea of using one-time money. Senate Minority Leader thinks it's a bad idea. House Minority Leader thinks it's a bad idea. Well, I, I wouldn't say that they've said it's a bad idea. They, they uh, you know, I've been uh, averse to using one-time money in the past as well. But this isn't using one-time money for the sake of using one-time money to let it go away. This is making an investment, uh, and it's being paid back, by the way, uh, in other uh, at other times when one-time money has been used to plug a hole somewhere, nobody has found a way just to pay it back. Uh, this plan actually pays that money, the borrowed money, back over a five-year period. So that, that's a huge difference in, in that. It's an investment. It's like borrowing from the bank and repaying. How can you guarantee that that money will be, will be paid back? Is that written in, a, in any proposed legislation? That's all and part of the plan, right? Yes. Yes. 
It's in the legislation we propose. So you guys have actually put a, a legislative uh, vehicle on the table? Yes. We have. Yes. Does yes. it have a number? We can't. No, no. We, we can't put numbers but, on. We, you we've have presented a, to, the, um, to, the to the leadership, to um, the conferees, uh, some language that pulled all of the pieces of a plan together from the budget to the interfund transfers to the SPED bill to the uh, contract negotiation bill that we proposed uh, at the beginning of this session uh, to the tax changes that, if you look on the spreadsheet that we provided at the press conference and that was provided again last night, all of those line items on the left have corresponding language and budget language um, in one document now, pulling the pieces together of what the legislature has worked on and what we are supplementing it with to create, to your point, John, um, this has always been about a five-year plan. In January, we presented to the House Ways and Means Committee three sets of ideas, one for immediate cost containment, one for, if you want to talk about a formula change, we're open to that as long as there's cost containment and a five-year plan going forward to continue to achieve savings and reinvest. So that's where there's not been the movement this year, and that's what this plan achieves. Governor, you, you talk about paying back the one-time money because that's important to you, uh, and that's going to come through this task force and the recommendations that it, that it makes. No, no, that's 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 already baked in. That isn't that's not included in the the two to three hundred million. This is uh, baked into the underlying proposal. We feel that's going to happen regardless. We feel uh, with the the stabilization of the tax rates for the next five years and paying that back, uh, the two hundred million, two to three hundred million is over and above that. So it's not based on what the recommendations of uh, having a statewide teacher's contract or? Well, no, staff. yeah, that's that's all part, it's all well, part well, of the, the. I guess what I'm wondering is, you're assuming that there's going to be action to save the money, and that you can use that money to pay back the one-time That's what a plan is all about. Right, well, what if the plan, you're gonna use the one-time money now with the hope that the plan is going to be put into place. What if it's not? No, no, that, that's all part of the legislation. It all has to be baked in together. The, the, I, think, I think Bob is particularly talking about the ratios, which goes ratios, to health care. Yeah, the health care has to be in. The special ed savings should be in. Those are areas that uh, that we believe that there's some consensus here. I mean, if we if you want to go back down memory lane, let's look back to last year. If we if we had in in. If we had been able to put the $25 million uh, state uh, health uh, care uh, benefit in the statute, we wouldn't be in near the position we are today. Wouldn't have used the one-time money that they had decided to use last year. But we would have uh, we've been in saving $25 million uh, this year. But at the end of that negotiation, you held a press conference where you said it was going to result in $13 million and That's less what, in right. reduced spending. Yeah, and, and it never never happened. They were uh, convinced, uh, you know, I was convinced by the, the conferees in our discussion uh, that it would happen naturally, uh, that they would just do the right thing, but it hasn't happened. But isn't, so, so isn't a lot of your plan baked on people doing the right thing and it will just happen? In putting, a, putting something into a statute, uh, you know, a health care plan, a statewide health care plan, sure. Yeah, I think that, that, would, the, that would do it. Particularly the ratio thing, that's a... You know, that's a, that's the over and above, that's the 200 million, and that's part of the task force. So did you feel sort of burned last year, and is that the no. reason for your... No, not, I don't money? feel burned. I just feel as though everyone's forgotten uh, that our proposal was to put uh, the health care benefit into uh, statute and have a statewide health care benefit. And, uh, and last year, we, nobody uh, could, uh, could find their, themselves... Um, a pathway to do that, uh, but now this year it's uh, it seems to be uh, a good idea. So I'm I'm thankful for that. It's a year late, but I'm thankful for that. So the Senate has language for a health care benefit that all parties have agreed to. I don't know that, for but well, you probably know more more about it than I do. Was in the committee room yesterday when Baruch brought it up, or when they talked about it, Baruch will not put it forward because you're going to veto. He's going to keep it as a bargaining chip. OK. So what's your response to that? Would you, would you consider not vetoing if it was 
No, we need the whole plan together. We need the health care benefit. We need uh, special education. Uh, we need all the provisions within the plan. We need something yeah, but of you substance. Yeah, the special education is happening. And, and that's, the ratio language is... That's passed both the House and the Senate? It's about two. Okay. <clears throat> well, we'll see what, what passes, you know? Maybe, so maybe, they'll go, maybe they're going to pass all these things, and, and maybe this is all for naught. But the so, education bill, and, or the tax bill, is still going to come back the way... Raising... It, you know, with either... Well, it's going to raise taxes either way. Well, then, then that gets vetoed. So, so even so if you get all your other parts of your plan. If they put it back into uh, to paying down the rate. I, for the life of me, again, we're, we're spending, they're contemplating spending upwards to $160 million more than last year, but that's not enough. They want to spend, they want to tax you $58 million more, and that's just not acceptable. That wasn't their decision. That was the voters in their tax. That's, uh, I, I just, I don't agree. I just, we, I fundamentally don't agree. That's I believe, process. I believe that the education fund can be managed. You don't believe, you don't agree that voters know when they vote for a higher budget that they will have to pay more tax money. I'm not, money. I'm, I'm not convinced that that's when they go into the booth that they're contemplating having to pay a, a seven, eight, nine percent uh, or cent uh, rise on their state property taxes. No, I don't believe that. So you, you just said that the the plan has to be taken as a whole. And that again sounds like that is not a compromise. That sounds like we need a, we need a plan to account for ways to uh, conserve in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, by just using one time money, that just doesn't seem acceptable to me either. We need a plan to make sure that we aren't in the same position year after year and that we can manage the fund. So I'm saying come up with a plan. It doesn't have to be my plan. Just come up with a plan uh, that shows how we can get over the next uh, few years and we're able to save money, uh, s spend less, um, and then raise enough money so that we can, we can reinvest in areas where really uh, is uh, beneficial to our kids. We know that special, uh, we know uh, that early childhood care and development is real. And by investing more in early childhood care and learning, uh, will have beneficial results. So if we, if we're able to raise, um, we think two to three hundred million. If they think a hundred million, that can be reinvested in in the kids, and get us uh, get us better results. So where's the part where you're willing to compromise? Within the plan. I mean, there, there may be areas again. They may want to, uh, uh, they want to, may want to go more years. They might go fewer years. They might want to put the uh, back plan in that they already passed once. There's areas uh, that we can uh, we can compromise within within that plan. There's uh, a number of bills heading your way. Uh, you get a veto minimum wage. Uh, I'm if I'm wondering if that's passed both the House and the Senate at this point. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, what about uh, medical monitoring for chemical exposure and that sort of thing? Are you going to veto that? Is that uh, is that passed? I think it's on it. Well, yes, yeah. It has. Uh, to be honest with you, we haven't looked at that. I don't. Have we received that yet, Jay? I don't think you've received any of them. Okay. Probably. There's another bill that would regulate dams or have DEC regulate all these small dams around Vermont and test uh, drinking water wells. Does that make sense to you? Um, again, I, I have to look at the the provision. That one didn't rise to the surface, as far as I can remember. Do you uh, uh, oppose? A tax on or fee on uh, manufacturers of opioids to cover some of the state's expenses and addiction and treatment? Uh, I, I do. Uh, it's another tax and fee as far as I'm concerned. And if it arrived with a with a tax, then I would I would be it away. On opioid manufacturers? Yeah. What about, um, there's a bill, I don't, I don't believe it com contains tax, that uh, set up a system to import cheaper prescription drugs uh, from Canada. Yeah. Um, I, again, we're waiting to receive that, but uh, we'll take and review it uh, just to make sure that it's technically correct. I'm um, I'm not sure how it's going to work, and I know that the, we have some concerns in uh, the Agency of Human Services over whether it really will save in the long run. But but again, uh, I think that we uh, we can we should try it and um, see if we can get uh, approval from the FDA 
and move forward. Anything we can do to, to reduce our costs in that regard, I think, is a good idea. So it sounds inevitable that there's going to be a, some kind of a June event here in the building. Uh, do you care whether it's a veto session or a special session? Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of rumors, uh, as you probably have as well, about whether they're going to schedule a veto session. Uh, that's totally up to them, obviously. Uh, separation of powers, they can do what they want. Uh, if they decide not to have a veto session, I don't, I'll call a special session. Doesn't matter to you. Doesn't matter to me. Did you, um, did you make the final call on Vermont Life? I've been, uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked about this uh, <laughs> over, not just this year, uh, but many years. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, it's an iconic magazine. Uh, it really is uh, some uh, part of our tradition. I know uh, seeing many of my relatives who receive that magazine every single year, but I don't have to remind any of you, uh, the media has changed, uh, and, uh, and the, the era of the magazines have changed. And it ran up a bill of uh, over $3 million. Um, we decided to, uh, to try it for another year uh, to see if we could resurrect and make it profitable, uh, but it doesn't appear to be working. So well, we have to do what we can. Uh, at this point in time, we just feel it's necessary uh, to finally uh, change directions. We'll keep the name uh, and, and maybe change it to something uh, digital, but um, the era of the, the print magazine will be over. When, well, two questions. One is, when was the decision actually made? And two, you mentioned giving it a try for a year. Uh, last September, it was put up for, for bid. The bids were all rejected in January. So when does that one year clock start? It seems like to me like it started in January. Well, I think it started previous to that from my uh, standpoint. Uh, Commissioner Sher um, or Secretary Shirley. Good afternoon. Uh, the, well, the, the running clock on our analysis of uh, Vermont Life started la last January, of course. Um, uh, as you've observed, 17. 17. So, uh, you know, we've been looking at the magazine as an enterprise since then. Uh, relative to the uh, RFP process, uh, as you'll recall, uh, earlier uh, in the fall of last year, uh, we put out to bid um, a variety of options for the future of Vermont life, and we got a number of responses. Uh, the best of those responses would have paid the state $25,000 and then shared in profits. Uh, following that, but the profit levels would have needed to be something that we haven't seen in two decades, so that was sort of a, uh, a stretch. Um, at the time, uh, based on the rolling uh, revenue, we thought that we could make this year in the black and then potentially make out years, 19, uh, potentially 20 in the black as we continue to assess what the future looked like. Uh, at the end of quarter three. Uh, so yes, when the decision was made, uh, ultimately it was made, I think, Monday of this week, finally. Um, but for about two weeks now, we've had the Q3 financials uh, under analysis. And uh, it was clear to us that while we can make it in the black for fiscal 18, beginning in July, we would be running uh, additional deficit. So um, you know, if things were different, if there wasn't a debt already, maybe the equation would have been different. But uh, to continue to run additional deficit spending is was not viable. Has you, have you made any attempt to quantify the return on that state investment? I mean, presumably this this magazine has been losing money for a long time now, but I imagine the determination was that the benefits that we derive from these expenditures warrant this deficit spending on this particular thing. So what, what, what made that calculation change for you? There were... Um, analyses of Vermont Life's economic impact done uh, under the prior administration. And there's a report available, I think, on the uh, Commerce website that shows you that in totality. Uh, there were disputes in this building as to whether that was a, a valid assessment, whether they were the right things that were, were looked at. But ultimately, it, the, the equation came down to whether it made sense to put taxpayers further in the red. and. Uh, both because the legislature has directed us not to do that and because even absent that direction, I don't think that would have been the prudent thing to do. Uh, we opted uh, to make this decision today rather than go further in the red beginning in January. Are there going to be layoffs as a result of the decision? And if so, how many? There will be six folks that are subject to a reduction in force. We met with them uh, early this morning. So what happens to them? They get assistance or offered? Other state jobs? Or As a result, uh, the, there's a collective bargaining agreement that strictly 
um, provides guidance on how all that occurs, and we're not allowed to get into the details of that until next Wednesday. So they'll be the first to learn of the, the details. You can, of course, find them in the collective bargaining agreement, but we're not allowed to get into the details with you. Mike, how much was the projected uh, loss going forward starting in July? And what was the annualized? The minimum uh, we were projecting for fiscal 19 would have been over $200,000. So a little bit smaller than the uh, most recent losses, but still substantial. So in your view was that 200000 it doesn't generate $200,000 worth of additional economic activity? Uh, not necessarily, just that w w there's, there's, we're not in a position to deficit spend. Um, the, the legislature actually uh, passed legislation last year saying it, you can't deficit spend, you have to backfill that. The dollars to backfill that have not been appropriated, so there isn't a way to do that. Does it seem strange to you that a state that is wholly dependent on tourism and has a product that cast the state in such a favorable light would be um, put to rest? Um, it's not surprising. It, it, I'm talking to the media, uh, for those of you watching at home. Um, and as you watch the evolution of, uh, of media from a, a front row seat, obviously there have been substantial changes in recent years, and that seems to continue to accelerate. And uh, print media um, certainly bearing the brunt of a lot of that that change. So this is this is no different. Um, it's a great asset, uh, great staff that we've got, and uh, unfortunately that the uh, unfortunately the economics just don't bear out anymore now. So will there be any original content being produced to uh, be delivered via the digital platforms? We don't know uh, exactly what that's going to look like yet. The state will retain the Vermont Life brand, and we certainly have ever-evolving digital channels, and we anticipate that there will be opportunities to use the Vermont Life moniker and brand uh, as a potential digital asset in the future, but this is just day one of uh, this transition, so we haven't assessed exactly what that might look like in the future. So you don't have a transition plan for the move to the, its digital existence now? No, um, we're, we're not taking Vermont Life to make it a digital magazine. We're retaining the brand and we have to assess what the best use of the Vermont Life brand will be. Again, this information uh, about the finances and the decision had to be made fairly rapidly. We've only known this for a few days. So it's, there's not going to be a digital version of Vermont Life? No. <laughs> Is there a budget? Uh, all in 1.1, 1.2 million? Yeah, the tourism budget, yes. The, the Vermont Life budget. 650 is in the budget, the FY19 budget. 650 okay. in how many subscribers? Uh, print subscribers? I have to look that up. And, and what did it come down to? Were you losing advertisers? Were you losing subscribers or some copy sales? Both. Uh, advertising being the largest uh, source of revenue and uh, ad revenue being down, uh, it precipitously declining, um, and subs subscription rates also declining. Is there some future, potential future value to the Vermont Life name that could be spun off later? It, conceivably. Uh, but again, at this point, um, you know, our, our attention is primarily focused on our our employees and then on uh, ensuring a, a smooth wind down over the course of the next few weeks. How are you addressing the debt and what is the running number at this point? We're using 3.5 million as the, uh, the, the best assessment there that may um, be altered a, a little bit, but, but we don't think substantively. And I'm sorry, I lost the front end of the question. Uh, Agency of Administration, Joint Fiscal Office, and the legislature will work on uh, a plan for addressing that in the, the coming days and weeks. Do you know if there's been anything um, included in the budget proposal, the Senate budget proposal, or either proposal that would address any of the debt? Or Earlier this year, we had a proposal uh, for the Think Vermont Move initiative that would have, in part, addressed the debt. That was uh, not an active piece of legislation under consideration, and the most recent uh, documents that uh, would address the debt were a letter from the Secretary of Administration to the legislature, I think dated just two days ago, uh, suggesting that a piece of the surplus uh, be used to retire the debt. For either of you, I just wondered if you could speak to what that magazine has meant to you, if you've had any personal interaction with it over the years, the significance of it for my life. It came to my house for uh, my entire childhood. It went to my grandparents' house. I remember uh, my grandparents had a sort of spiral staircase with a little telephone stand with an old rotary dial telephone and there were Vermont Life issues stuck in the uh, in the stand so um, 
unfortunately, my grandmother's not with me to uh, yell at me about today, but she probably wouldn't be very happy. So why not take the uh, best offer you got from that RP process? If you're getting rid of it anyway, why not hand it off? We think logistically, at this good, great question, and that's something we contemplated. Uh, we think logistically, we're not able to reopen a closed RFP process. Um, it's just not something that uh, you're allowed to do. But you could reopen. You could create a new RFP process. You could, and uh, you know those options we haven't explored yet. Again, our our focus has been just ensuring that we get this information to our employees as quickly as possible to legislators before they go home. Uh, and then ensure a, a smooth transition given that uh, the wind down is going to have to happen in uh, just a few short weeks. Earlier this week, the administration put out a, li a list of, of possible uses for the $44 million in, in extra revenue this year. And one of those items was $3.6 million yes. to pay off the debt for Vermont Life, which obviously means this decision was extremely sudden and recent. Mm -hmm. Correct. <laughs> um, just point out that. The debt has to be paid off regardless of whether Vermont yes. Life exists or not. So I just wanted to make sure that's understanding. That, and the debt has been on the balance sheet for a number of years. It's built up. So whether or not we have a magazine functioning or not, the state owes the money, and we intend to pay it off. And, and again, there was a ray of hope when it was running in the black, and there was uh, thoughts that uh, maybe we could prevail and continue uh, to offer the subscription for Vermont Life, but that didn't come to be. Governor Scott, the minimum wage um, legislation, um, you said in the beginning you wanted to make Vermont more affordable for individuals who live here. Is that part of that, or is that something you don't No, I, I don't believe that that will help uh, at all. I, I believe that that artificially raises uh, the cost of living in Vermont and puts uh, particularly those on the uh, the eastern side of our, our state at a tremendous disadvantage to New Hampshire. Um, so uh, rural parts of the state would suffer tremendously with a, uh, with a raise in the artificial raise of the uh, minimum wage. Is there a publicly available version of that uh, legislation that wraps all of the plan together? Yeah, that? Sure. Uh, Governor, uh, in that list of, of uses for the, the anticipated surplus, uh, your administration also asked for $10 million for paving projects. And uh, why, out of everything you could spend that money on, would that be a priority for you? Well, we had a, a very difficult winter. Uh, we're receiving a, a tremendous amount of complaints about surface uh, conditions uh, on many of our roads uh, throughout the state, uh, Wilmington being one uh, down on Route 100, uh, many in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, so, uh, again, with the, the freeze-thaw cycles and the number of them we've had this year, it seems to have taken its toll on the surfaces in particular. Uh, so we thought if this was uh, money that was available, uh, this would give uh, immediate relief uh, to, to many that have to drive those, uh, those roads each and every day. So uh, we just thought it was an appropriate use. It would do $100 million or $10 million would do about 85 uh, miles of, of roadway. So we thought uh, it would be good use of money. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Governor. Thank you.